thanks everybody. It's great to be on the builder stage. I've been hanging out in the enterprise stage the, the whole time. So uh, let's just kick it off with some introductions and then uh, dive right into some discussion. So why don't you folks introduce yourself and talk a bit about your companies. Sure. Hey, everyone. I'm Chris Wanstroth. I'm co-founder and CEO of GitHub. Uh, GitHub helps people build software together. It's the largest open source and software development community in the world. You can post anything you want publicly for free. You can find code there, download it. You can also use it to share private proprietary code. So we have an enterprise offering where you can run your own version of GitHub on your own servers or on AWS, or you can just use github.com and host everything there. Yeah, hi. Ben Uretsky, CEO and co-founder of DigitalOcean. And we're simplifying cloud infrastructure for developers. Many of them are using GitHub as a way to collaborate and produce new applications, uh, right in the next generation of, of, of companies, essentially on the internet. And we're the platform, the infrastructure provider underneath, enabling those, those developers to do some pretty amazing things. So uh, why don't you just uh, sort of kick off the discussion with uh, really what a developer needs to know today uh, in general and to work with your tools and how your tools work together and just sort of give us the broader context. Yeah, so I think development, right, and this is a great stage to talk about on, on builders is we're, we're all building uh, building something. And DigitalOcean, the way that we think about it is, is simplifying innovation and enabling developers to go on and do those amazing things, the, the apps and services that, that, that change our life. And this, this industry is extremely complex, right? The abstraction layers, the virtualization, the, the, the server and networking space continues to evolve. Um, and the important thing to remember is what the developer cares about is not the infrastructure underneath. He cares about the actual utility, the value that's delivered to, to, to the customer, the user, uh, someone that's actually interacting with the product. And so how do you enable them to figure out that fit rather than spending time on infrastructure? And I think, you know, Chris with GitHub provides an entirely new way to think about writing those applications. Yeah, that's exactly how we think about it too. I mean, internally we talk a lot about how GitHub should be a, like Wi-Fi, where you only really notice it when it's broken or it's not working. Really what GitHub should let you do, and I think DigitalOcean and a lot of this new generation of developer tools is get out of the way so you can focus on what you're building. So we say like you shouldn't be fiddling with GitHub, you should be fiddling with your code, right? You shouldn't be mad at GitHub, you should be mad at your code. What we really want to do is sort of disappear and really give you the time and energy back to spend building your thing and not having to worry about how you want to do code review or how you want to deploy your applications. That stuff should, should be figured out. It should be obvious, it should be easy. That sh then, then should let you focus on solving like, the hard problems which are unique to your business. The code review is not unique to anyone's business at this point. So one of the things, one of the things I noticed, uh, you know, the organizers gave me a little cheat sheet here, is you're both CEOs and co-founders. And of course, there's a lot of co-founders in the room as well. So it'd be great to sort of understand sort of the, the founding story. How did you found your organization? How did you end up as CEO? What is it like to be the CEO of a company you founded, et cetera? You know, just tell us a bit about what it means to start a company like your respective uh, companies. Well, I'm actually a, a second time CEO, but both times I've built those businesses with my brother, partner, and, and co-founder. So that's a very interesting dynamic. And you know, you, you carry some parts, kind of like the CEO component is, you're, you're, you're the face of the business, both internally and externally, but I really, I really think and start first and foremost as, as a co-founder, really coming together, sharing in that vision, figuring out why we're starting this company, what, what we're all about, where we're headed, and I think that's what separate, that's what drives you know, VCs to say, hey, we love co-founding teams, we think they're the right ones to run the company, and you know, they see it as a failure if they have to step in or, or, or replace a co-founder. And you know, we, we, we've gone through a lot of these kind of transitions, and sometimes you do part ways with the original co-founding team, but you also lose a, you know, a piece of the soul of, of the company. And so to me, personally, I think the co-founder title actually represents so much more, because you can always hire another CEO. You can't ever hire another co-founder. And uh, you know, I think the CEO title has really come into play much more so now that the business has grown to 100 people, and you don't have the same type of relationship with everyone. Uh, sometimes they just see you as a, you know, 
the person that kind of run, runs the show. And it, it's hard to build that personal relationship. At the same time, I, I definitely make myself available and still interview the last round with anyone who, who will start at the company so that I can actually have a meaningful relationship uh, with, with that person rather than you know seeing them for the first time in the office and saying, hey, you know, how, how's the weather? I'm also a second time CEO, but they are both at the same company. So I was a co-founder slash CEO of GitHub for the first four years. And um, there, were, there were four founders of GitHub. And so I was the CEO because I registered the business in Sacramento. PJ was the CFO because he wrote the billing code. And Tom was the CTO because he procured the servers. So we didn't really take the, the C-level titles too seriously. Scott was the CIO because like, what, what's a CIO? Uh, so we didn't take those titles too seriously for the first couple years of the business. And um, it was very much, you know, we were all wearing tons of different hats. We were all doing everything we could. Um, as I learned more about how companies work, I really think my job was closer to a product manager or a PM in the early days, more so than a, than a CEO, as is traditionally defined. So when we hit 100 employees, we were still bootstrapped. We'd still never raised any outside investment. And we decided that we were going to start taking the business itself more seriously. And part of that meant just sitting down and writing out what the responsibilities of each of the co-founders would be. And it was at this point in time that it became clear that like, when I listed out the things I wanted to work on and where I wanted to spend my time, and my co-founders went through the same exercise, that maybe I wasn't the best fit for being CEO because all my things had to do with coding still, product management, working on the website every day, and not so much building out the support organization in the company or raising funding or doing any of that sort of, sort of stuff. So when we hit 100 employees, my co-founder, Tom Preston Werner, became CEO, and I became titleless. Uh, Chief Product Officer, I think we made that one up, although there might be a Wikipedia page on it. And it was, we, we, I got a lot more serious about what I was doing, I got a lot more into the development, and it was um, a, a bit, really big change for me in my life to go from being co-CEO, really, with three other people, being involved in every single high-level decision that's being made about the business and the strategy, to just focusing on GitHub and GitHub.com, um, especially when our aspirations at the time were to become a multi-product company. So I felt like my role was becoming even more narrow into leading product of just one of our potentially many products. Um, and I enjoyed the challenge, and it was really interesting. And then, so fast forward 18 months later, and um, our enterprise product started really taking off, and we started as a business talking more seriously about how we are going to reach audiences that we know nothing about. I mean, GitHub very much was a story of we built a product for ourselves, we were developers, we built a business around it, all the marketing and everything that we did to grow it was really exactly what we wanted to experience as customers. And when we hit this new stage where people were coming to us, they're saying, I use GitHub every day online and I want to use it at uh, my, my the bank that I work at or I work for the government or I work for a small school district and I'm just not allowed to use the cloud, we started saying, okay, wow, like these people, they're developers, they want to be using pull requests, but we don't know what their life looks like. We don't know how they want to be spoken to. We don't know what their needs are. Do they want phone support or not? Like, I certainly don't want phone support. I don't want to ever talk to someone on the phone, but maybe that's not how everyone thinks. And really what we care about is the pull request. It is the code review. We want to do that really well so you don't have to. And so whether that's in the cloud, whether that's on-prem, whether that's phone support or email support, I'm, I don't care. Like, I want to make it the best experience for you. I'm going to go to where you are. We want to have GitHub work really well in your ecosystem and your comfort zone. And so as we began realizing this and as we began sort of reevaluating what our roles were, Tom said, you know, I think that for the next stage of GitHub's growth, you should be the CEO because you've been so close to the product. And now that we're changing, you've been also very close to the customers. And we need to get really serious about listening to our customers because they're no longer exclusively us. Now we're talking to many, many more people who are very, very different than us. And the company needs to grow and adapt. So we've always been pretty awesome in that uh, we like to think of ourselves as doing things differently. And I think the two CEO swaps really uh, speak to that. So in January of 2014, I became CEO for my second time at the same company. And since then, it's, it's totally different than the first time around. I have very much a CEO job. All the big quotes you read about delegating and all that shit, I don't know how to do any of that. Or I, I didn't know how to do any of that until a couple months on the job. And the biggest contrast is CEO at a three-person startup is your hands are in everything. And you can't, you can't delegate anything. You don't have time. You have to be there coding. You have to be there working with a tax accountant. You have to be there doing everything. Now, when you're the CEO of a 300-person company, it's the opposite. You, you need to help people grow. You need to take your hands off. And even, and the hardest thing for me is like, there's clearly stuff that I care deeply about, like the coding, practices around there, some of the design. 
even the things you care most about, you need to step back and help other people become experts at these because the company needs to run without you and most importantly, the company needs to run like a team. So even though you might be the best at something or think you're the best at something and no one tells you that you're not, you really need to help other people become the best at things. And this has been a really cha big challenge for me and a big learning experience is like the complete polar opposite of do everything yourself to try to do as little as possible, but be involved and help people grow. And it's been really exciting and uh, really awesome to see it work now that I'm 15 months into it. But you see all these quotes about delegating and it's, it's so much harder in practice when you're so used to being so hands-on for so long. So how much was DigitalOcean a uh, similar story? You know, developers doing what developers wanted to do and then turning into a real business, sort of, you know, like growing up, uh, whether you liked to or not. We're still, we're still in an earlier stage. Uh, we do have hundreds of thousands of customers worldwide. And for us, we, we want to stay as true to those roots as possible. It's really about, you know, how, how do we enable the next generation of entrepreneurs, of, of startup builders, of, of company creators? It's like what we're seeing more and more with the internet becoming so prevalent is this kind of like software defined company. You walk into any office across the world today and it's, and it's the same scene over and over. Someone's sitting behind a computer, hacking away on their keyboard. It's financial, it's, it's healthcare, it's all the different services today. And so what they need is a stable, reliable, easy to use platform to actually build their software defined company on top of. And that's the developer tool that you know, DigitalOcean represents. And for, for myself, I, I really do see myself as a, as a builder, as a kind of like co-founder. So there's a lot of harmony in the way that we think about DigitalOcean enabling other people to build things on top of it. It's very cyclical and circuitous in, in, in nature. And uh, I think what's, what's exciting for, for us is that it still doesn't feel like you know, we need to, so to speak, sell out or, or chase some higher margins or go after enterprise accounts. It, it really is the developer story. Like, I mean, I am just impressed at the community that GitHub has been able to build with you know, eight million software developers across the world that are that are defining the next generation of applications of software. You know, really in an open source uh, movement. And you know, that's those are my roots. That's that's where I come from. Reading you know, man pages on Linux and uh, you know just trying out new operating systems and, and, and really excited about the opportunity because there are more developers than ever before and they're going on to create amazing things. So, you know, that's obviously your, you know, your Ubers and your Airbnbs and whatnot, but there's also all these really niche applications and stuff we're doing in, in robotics, in, um, you know, in, in quantum computing. I mean, that's, that really, all of that requires great collaboration and that's driven through an open community environment, but also requires uh, the right tools and the right infrastructure. And that's where DigitalOcean really snugs in and fits into that equation. Certainly, there are, there are huge companies out there that you could use that you might think of as reliable, but at the same time, they're not a pure cloud company. DigitalOcean is one of the only pure cloud companies in, in the world. You know, Obviously, the, the Amazons, the Googles, their business was centered and focused on something else. And so for us, we see the vision as how do we how do we simplify this really complex um, set of, of tools and infrastructure and enable the developer to build an amazing application that they can share with the rest of the world. And that's really been empowering. And, and even walking around uh, Collision today, which I think, by the way, is just an awesome event, there are so many customers that we're bumping into from the, uh, the startups that are exhibiting to just people walking up to us and, and just saying, hey, we really love the product, you know, we love what you guys are up to, and I think that inspires us to continue down this same road. And you know, in, in, in my heart of hearts, I wish that the opportunity with the developer community, empowering them, growing with them, is large enough that we never have to shift away, and that we can stay this course for the entire life of, of, of the business, because you know, it might be a fraction of the overall kind of public cloud spend, but it's, it's the exciting part, and we want to play a role in that. So you mentioned open source, and I know that's a common theme across your companies. So talk a bit about how, uh, how you support open source and how you see open source playing a role as your companies mature. Uh, you know, it's, it's, e it's one thing if you have a group of developers cranking out open source as a small company, it's another as you become a very, uh, much larger, it becomes a, a different set of challenges. So it'd be interesting uh, to get each of your take on, on the whole open source story. So challenges, lawyers, that's the biggest challenge as you get as you get bigger. Um, 
you know, the way we view open source is like in the in the late in the late 90s, when Linux was really becoming popular and Torvalds was on the cover of Wired magazine and uh, open source is becoming a household name, it was very much this dichotomy of closed source versus open source, or at least this is the way that I was viewing all of it in the news. And I think that the change has been in the past two decades, believe it or not, since then, that open source doesn't really fight with closed source anymore. Open source has become very much a way of building good software and not the only way of doing it. So if you look at 20 years ago, and let's say very few companies were doing unit, were doing unit testing or automated testing or automated builds or spinning up uh, instances in the cloud to, to do a QA server, these are now pretty much standard parts of building software development. And our belief is very much that open source is part of that. So there's a checklist of things, right? Like code review, uh, working on a team, doing unit tests open source. That is now on that checklist. And so whether you're building proprietary software or not, it doesn't matter because you're going to be using open source. And a lot of these companies have been doing it for two decades. They've been running on Linux. They've been using MySQL. And so while you might have some huge bank that doesn't release any open source, you, you can be damn sure that they've been consuming it for many, many years. More years than like kids that are building iPhone apps now have been alive. So the real transition isn't companies now using open source, it's A, them admitting and realizing that they've been using it all along, and then B, them starting to contribute to it. And that's the big thing that we're seeing is Microsoft just open source.net last year, They're this platform. And a lot of people in the news were saying, oh, this means that it's the end of life for .net. But it's the opposite. If anything, this has breathed new life into this platform. And so you have a huge enterprise company like Microsoft who obviously their primary goal is making money, why are they doing open source? It's because they believe it's a good business strategy. It's because they believe doing open source will actually make them more money. So that's sort of how we view it too. We're pragmatists. It's like we've been doing tons of open source since day one, but what really drew me to it as an engineer was like this is how you build better software. This is an awesome way to learn, to interact, to meet people, to, to save time. I can just download some authentication library instead of having to roll my own of everything from scratch. And it, can, it turns into more and more larger companies are now seeing that, oh, this is how people are building good software now. And so this is a community we want to be involved in. There's no way Microsoft will ever be 100% open source. And GitHub is not 100% open source. But we open source where it makes sense in the same way that we do unit testing where it makes sense. We do code review where it makes sense. So I think the, the trend is you're going to see a lot of the big sleepy companies like companies making light bulbs and making paint that have a thousand software engineers in the Midwest. And those are the companies that are going to start to be doing open source in the next five years. And that's going to be more interesting. Like Facebook, of course, they're doing open source. Microsoft, I can say with 2020, like looking back, of course, they're doing open source. No one saw it coming. But when you start to see companies that are building light bulbs and making tents doing open source, that's what's going to be real transformative for the entire world, I think. And that's what we're really excited about is all the startups already know it. Now the big tech companies are starting to see it. What is the next phase? It's the companies that just have software engineering departments and don't think of themselves as tech companies that are participating in open source. That's when it's going to be much, much bigger for everyone. Yeah, op open source is tackling some of the world's largest problems is the way that you know we look at it. it just take Linux for, for example. I mean, the majority of the world's infrastructure that provides our services today runs on top of this open source operating system. And as Chris said, the, the enterprise is finally catching up. They're beginning to open source their tools. They're recognizing that, hey, the, the power of our, of our service, of, of our product, isn't necessarily in the code. It's in the actual value that's delivered. I mean, an ultimate goal for, for DigitalOcean would be to share our source code with everyone inside an open source project and say, hey, now you have the power to run the same exact cloud that DigitalOcean runs. Because it's not, you know, the, the code isn't really, on one hand, it is certainly our differentiation. It's our, it's our unique, ex unique experience. It's the API, it's the interface, it's all of that that is expressed through our code that makes this company valuable. But at the same time, if all you did was just steal it, can you actually build a meaningful product with it? And, you know, it's, it's hard to replicate the community. That's a huge layer of differentiation and value uh, to us about, you know, and, and what I love about our community actually is that we are one of the only places on the web where users can come and talk about how to leverage open source and how to use these projects that help them build amazing things. I mean, you have Stack Overflow as a great example, but that's more like, hey, I bumped my head in the wall, here's an error, here's, here's a solution. There isn't a place that says, hey, have you heard of Nginx? And it actually runs 10 times faster than like Apache or IIS, so why don't you use that web server instead and save yourself a lot of like headache and grief. And so we, we try to contribute and support open source in whatever possible way we can. 
the ultimate goal and aspiration is that we share our code with the world because we know that we know how to run we know how to run the infrastructure underneath it it's a tremendously expensive and difficult business you know the ops component kind of support uh, all of those additional value added services are not in the code that's what makes DigitalOcean wonderful that it is this automated platform that provides instant provisioning simple and easy to use infrastructure a community of developers you know gives back um, to to meetups and people all across the world, and and we just want to carry that kind of you know uh, educate, inspire, and and share it with with everyone else. And I mean, we're excited to see the things that you know Tesla is doing and open sourcing their car designs and and, and batteries. Um, the same thing is happening in the server space with with the Open Compute project and these kind of new equipment manufacturers. Same thing is happening in the network world with. Um, Cumulus and, and, and white label uh, switches. So it's it's no longer you know your your secret sauce isn't uh, necessarily just the software. It's how you're actually using it and the value that you can provide from from that software. So you, you mentioned uh, the community around uh, DigitalOcean, and I know GitHub has a, a diverse and active community. And I'm sure a lot of startups, especially ones with an open source strategy, are saying, well, okay, we're going to build some great software, and then we're going to build this community. But it's easier said than done. So if you could give some, the audience some pointers, how did you end up with your, your respective diverse and large communities? And what are some pointers for actually getting that rolling? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, it started out not very diverse at all. It started out for us in the Ruby community and then to a uh, smaller extent, the JavaScript community, because that's the community that we were a part of. I think that's a huge thing, especially as a, we're talking about like co-founders and roles. It's like you need to, to um, for us, at least, you need to immerse yourself in the community. You need to be a part of the community. We've always listened to our customers. Um, and really, in the early days, that just meant like hanging out with our friends and going to things like this and drinking with people and going out to, to the coffee and asking them, like, what do you need in GitHub? Like, what would you like? And taking that feedback and building it right into the platform. The, the thing about a startup is you can just move so quickly. And like, what that means, literally, is you can talk to someone at lunch and they have something shipped by dinner. And you really can't do that as you get to be a larger company because of processes and rules and stuff, which I don't actually think is, is a horrible, like, evil thing, but it's just like the way the world works is you want to be more responsible, you want to be more respectful. For example, we have a training team now, so I can't just go change a button on the website because we have all this curriculum based around it. We need to have a coordinated lunch. When we were five people, I was changing buttons all the time. Like, that's like a really, really awesome part of it. And then that brings the community closer too, right? If you and I go to coffee, and then the next morning you wake up and you see that your suggestion was implemented, that's, that's huge. I've been on the I've been on the consumer side of that too, and it's just like the most amazing feeling to know that you're heard, to know that your opinions are valued, and to know that someone is building something for you. So in the early days, I think it's just to be obsessed and immersed in the community as much as you can, and then do that for other communities. I mean, that's what we did. I learned Python. I started going to Django Conf. I really ended up liking it as a Ruby person. But for me, that was very much twofold. It was I need to learn more about other communities because GitHub is filled with other communities. And two, like I need to be I need to show that I'm like walking the walk, right? Like if I really care about Python, I should learn about it. I should be able to have a conversation with a Python developer. I should understand what their feedback is. And so that was a huge, huge thing for us in the early days. Now it's a lot more difficult as we're talking about becoming a, a more prominent in the .NET community or the Java community. I don't know .NET, and I'm learning it now that it runs on Mac. But what we really need to do is find experts in the .NET community who really do care about it, who really understand it, who really want to go and spend time listening and taking feedback. And while we may be a little bit slower to implement features, we still want to listen just as well as we listened in the early days. So my biggest advice is like be authentic and be a part of the community. And it's OK to be like, yo, I'm learning Python because I want you to use my website. Like People appreciate that because you're still there learning Python, and you're still there listening to them, and you want them to make you want them to tell you how to make your website better. It's still very authentic. So I think it's really about like putting your cards on the table and actually doing it. Yeah, we, had a, we have an interesting story in that regard because being based out of New York City, I think, is very different than being based out of the Valley. And so you can, there's certainly a, a blooming tech scene in New York, but you know, it doesn't begin to rival some of these larger communities that exist elsewhere. So the way we thought about it is we, we put the user first, and we said, you know, I, I was thinking about the early days when I was learning Linux and, and learning, you know, systems architecture and development for the very first time. There were a lot less resources available, um, and so you had to resort more to towards manuals and, and traditional documentation. O'Reilly was the community that I also associated myself with, right? There's this amazing set of authors that are sharing their best practices, their expertise, you know, after decades of, of building cool stuff. And so, 
that was kind of like the same spark that we wanted to bring forward with with our community and it, and it didn't even necessarily start as a community it started as a you know just just content and education around hey we've built some pretty amazing things um, and, and now we're going to share how to use this technology because that actually is still very very difficult right and and that also embodies the spirit of what DigitalOcean is. It's like simplify how to build awesome, amazing things and, and share and share with other people. So today we have over a thousand tutorials, uh, how to's, guides, you know, we even see customers or users essentially uh, put in a, a search like, hey, how do I install Ruby on Rails DigitalOcean? Because they know our community has the right information and, and they trust that content. And so uh, we have an interesting story. My my cousin was the first content writer with, within our community team, and uh, she she majored in uh, the cl classic literature, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and 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 obviously wanted to get into tech like all of us. So we thought that would be you know just a, a perfect person to have on board who has great command of language, but at the same time is learning tech for the first time. And, and that was the, the origin for the community that we've built out over the last couple of years. And now, you know, we're getting uh, four or five million visitors a month to, to the information that we've built around how to leverage open source. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just really inspiring that our product itself, uh, the droplet and the, the infrastructure that we sell, we only have roughly half a million uh, customers. But users, community members is, is, is in the millions. And you know that doesn't even take into account the people that are just, hey, oh, this is a great article, I've learned from it, thanks so much, and, and, and just leave right away. So I, I think the power of, of a community is just really immense. Everyone being able to come together for a greater cause. We actually even crowdsource a, a ton of the, the content that we're able to share. So if there is an expert uh, who believes in what the DigitalOcean community stands for, we, we contribute back. We, we pay that person, they'll write a tutorial, we'll add it into our community, and, and it grows. Uh, so it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, I think that's actually a really important point. Um, if, you're, if, if you're a developer in the room and you're trying to be a co-founder and build a company, or if you're not a developer in the room and you're also trying to be a co-founder and build a company, for me, a lesson that I learned the hard way was like it's so easy to get obsessed with just the code and the product and to think that that's the only thing that matters. Like if I just do this feature correctly, if I just build this thing the right way, this is going to be it. I can sit back; it'll all be success. But like build is not about develop, and even develop isn't necessarily about code, right? There's so much more that goes into it. And so the documentation and the community, these are all things that you have to build. You're really building an experience. And what you really need to think about is the person who's using your software, the person who's using your product, they don't care about your feature. They care about how you make their life better. They care about you solving a problem for them. And sometimes the way you can solve a problem for them is by writing really good documentation that helps them get up and running, even though your console is really beautiful and you can log in with GitHub and Facebook and all these flabsy features, right? So like, if you are technical, it's very easy to go into your cave and your comfort zone and think that you can solve all problems with software. But really what you need to build is an experience. You need to build something that makes people's lives better. And that's way more than just the product itself. Like, this is the thing. Everything that Ben just talked about isn't about the code. It's about the documentation. And this is why open sourcing something like GitHub or DO isn't really that interesting. Or if it was, I don't think that there'd be a substantial GitHub competitor that popped up the next day. Because for them to actually be able to compete with us, it's way more than just the GitHub.com code. It is the training. It's the community. It's the conferences. It's the tutorials. This is what you're building when you're building a company. You're building a community internally and externally. And so if you're not technical and you're worried like you're not a coder, that's not the problem. What you need to focus on is building experiences for people. And if you are technical, don't get so obsessed with the code that you forget that really what you're doing is delivering something to people. And whether that's software or not, no one really cares. What they care about is what you're doing for them. And with that, we'll have to wrap up. We're out of time. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.